If you're running a company, one of the things you've probably noticed is there's a lot of menial admin work. It takes hours to onboard new employees, and with org chart changes or sending out annual reminders for training, it's a ton of work. So it's no wonder that most startup founders simply can't afford to deal with that mountain of paperwork that has to be handled manually. That's where Rippling comes in. Founded in 2018, the company's mission is to create a single system for employee information that companies can plug and play right into. HR and payroll software might be unsexy, but the total market's actually gonna be $35 billion in the next six years. Rippling's platform allows for one-click hiring, payroll, benefits, training, and a lot more than that, actually. We're gonna find out today. It's one of the biggest and best redemption stories I've ever seen. Rippling's already grown to be valued at $6.5 billion in just the four years since we were the first investor. We're proud to be one of the earliest believers in one of the best founders I've ever met, Parker Conrad. Let's get started. Parker, welcome back to the channel. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me. Tell me more about you as a youngster growing up in you know, the Upper East Side of New York City. When I was 12 years old, I was um, the uh, understudy for Colin Craven in The Secret Garden on Broadway. Oh, right. And then by high school, though, you wanted to become a scientist then. I was really interested in, in, um, in science. I got a job working for a lab um, up at Columbia. The lab that I was working in studied uh, sea slugs and basically looked at like neurological development and how, how uh, try, was trying to understand how learning and memory worked, basically. You actually had placed in uh, you know, one of the top projects on one of the national science um, competitions, wasn't it? There was, this, there was this thing called the Westinghouse Science Talent Search that I think got renamed the Intel Science Talent Search and then I think it's something else now. But um, yeah, I, I uh, applied for that for that and got a, a scholarship and came in third place and um, it was a lot of fun. We, we have a lot of uh, mutual friends in common. My wife went to Harvard and so you actually spent, I think, a lot of uh, time at the Crimson. I spent basically 70 hours a week working on the paper. I failed out of school um, and had to take time off because I didn't go to class but really uh, had a lot of fun with it. There was, uh, in fact, I think a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of what sort of drew me to um, working on startups was how much fun I had doing that in college. And for me, what, what I liked about it was always, um, you know, feeling like we were sort of this band of pirates that was like taking on the administration. And uh, that spent a bunch of time after college sort of looking for that experience again and, and kind of found it in, um, in working at startups. Especially since last time we talked, you've come so far. Rippling is now a multi-billion dollar company. And how does it feel like sort of the second time around? It feels, I mean, I, I think it, it, it's, always, um, it's always nice to see the company grow. I think the thing that's been different for me <clears throat> doing Rippling now as a company that's in a fairly similar space that to my last company, and I—I I mean, I would say they're com they're completely different and totally different. But they're there there's some they sort of rhyme a little bit. Um, and I think the thing one thing that's been different for me, um, and and has been nice about it is the first time around, I always felt, you know, just a lot of um, a lot of imposter syndrome, just constant fear of like not understanding, you know, what was coming next, and you know, sort of barely kind of keeping afloat the whole time. And Rippling, I mean, we have our challenges, but it does feel a little bit like, you know, okay, I've been here before. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen this. I know what I'm doing. I know sort of how, how sort of have a sense for how things are going to play out. That makes it a, a lot easier for sure. Last time we talked, the focus was HR and IT. And at that moment, there was sort of this realization, uh, something like 12 to 15% of all revenue in all companies just gets spent on uh, those two combined. I think the key insight at Rippling is that employee data is a lot more distributed across a company than most people realize. Um, so when when you talk about employee data, most people think HR department and HR business systems. 
And I think that almost every business system a company uses is full of information about employees. And that creates really kind of two issues for companies. One is a, a, you know, a problem, and I think a, the other is a, a, a follow-on opportunity. And the first issue is that it means that there's all this irreducible administrative work at a business maintaining information about your org and your employees and all these different business systems. Um, every time you hire someone, you've got to set them up everywhere. You got to configure them correctly. And as things change, some or all of these systems are implicated. And so as companies grow, you, you develop this, just this layer of administrative roles, HR coordinators, IT coordinators, finance coordinators that are doing systems administration, all these different systems. And the way that this should all work is you should really have one underlying system where companies and their employees go to make changes that handles the propagation out to everything else. And that's effectively what, what Rippling is and what we do. And the second thing that I think is kind of interesting is that all of the other, you know, all of the, the different business software systems out there all kind of understand this dynamic and they know that if they ask their clients for a lot of information about their employees and about their company, it makes their system harder to use, more administratively complex, it makes implementations longer. And so they tend to be really hesitant to ask for a lot um, and they try and minimize it. And as a result of that, I think most business software today knows a lot less about your employees and about your company than it ought to. That creates this opportunity for Rippling um, where you can kind of rebuild a lot of these different uh, sort of business software products on this underlying set of components where employee information is deeply embedded in the system from day one. And, and that means that you can do things like uh, you know, lots of, lots of business software, they uh, have, have concepts like you know, workflow, reports, alerts, permissions, policies, all that kind of stuff. And all those things have this tie to employee data. If you understand the org chart of the company, you can build much better role-based permissions because you can say someone gets the following setup or configuration because of their job or role or function in the company rather than because I like had to add them to this list. And that, you know, lots of different business software has that concept and you can really kind of dial that stuff in really well if you have this underlying understanding of, of information about employees. We first met about this idea for Rippling. I think it was really just an idea uh, but what really got me was how coherent the initial use case was, which is initially just how do we make it so that when we hire someone, it's a lot faster. And then I think the next thing you built was um, actually login support, right? Which makes sense. Like one of the, you know, not only do you get a laptop, you also get all of your accounts. And then yeah. it's just interesting to see how that layers in with what you just said, which is this 15% of all money going to like, software just for HR and IT, there are all these silos. You know, why is it that you have 10 or 20 different logins that don't really talk to each other? And then yeah. now coming along, like if you have Rippling as your authentication, how uh, new accounts are created and you know all about all of the employees, well, you can start linking that together, which sort of brings us to today, which is a new thing. You know, a couple of years ago when we were talking about this, like this was not a term that we talked about which is the compound startup. In some ways, the, the deadweight loss of the SaaS revolution is the systems fragmentation that companies now deal with because they have all these different point solutions. I think today, the, even the conventional wisdom on how you should build a company is that you want to like focus really narrowly and build one extremely narrow thing and go very deep on it. And I think that a lot of that, that conventional wisdom is wrong. Um, and I think it, it probably, it used to work maybe 10 or 15 years ago, the industry was in this place where there was this shift from on-prem on software to you know, cloud and SaaS software. And so there was this kind of opportunity where you could just find you know, something that companies would have done in, you know, with Oracle or you know, the SAP or something like that and peel off like a, a specific feature or point solution and turn it into a standalone SaaS company and almost any business process that you could find, you could start a SaaS company and it, and it, it turns out in retrospect, it had a decent chance to become a billion dollar, you know, a unicorn business. And the problem now 
<clears throat> is that a lot of those opportunities have been picked over. And so there's now like any sort of business process or any problem that companies have, like there's a SaaS company doing that and probably multiple SaaS companies doing that. And so I think it's hard, you know, when all of that has been sort of picked over to build a really big business doing just that. But I think there's now this new opportunity, which is to say, okay, um, there are these undiscovered islands of product market fit, maybe just beyond the horizon line. And if you can sort of sail out there and build what's much more challenging execution wise, but to try and build a set of really interoperable services that work cohesively together, then that that set of multiple different products that work together seamlessly, which, which I call a compound startup to distinguish it from a focused startup, that that can actually um, really win against this sort of less well integrated collection of point SaaS systems. And so Rippling, I think, is, a, <clears throat> is an example of a, of a compound startup of trying to take on a lot of different things simultaneously. Um, and there are some inherent uh, product advantages and some inherent sales and marketing advantages that you have over a lot of like standalone systems. I think that's one of the things I've been excited about for uh, this idea of the compound startup in that instead of having 10 or 20 different things that sort of don't really talk to each other, you can have one thing that all works very well together, but then can actually be you know, customized for your need, which is sort of the classic software problem. It's like, you, you know, what you, what you want is something that is very low bar and what you know, sort of rippling as an OS does is you already have all your employees, you have credentials that you're able to onboard and like have a sense for who, who is everyone on the team. And based on that, who should have access to what systems and how should it work together? And like that sort of just couldn't yeah. exist without you. I have this theory that there's this sort of uh, coming wave of rebundling in business software that you had this sort of over the last 15 years, the trend was unbundling these big legacy systems um, that you used to have these megapoly business software vendors that sold you know, everything to a company. And the trend has been to sort of unbundle that and have all these different point SaaS systems. But you know that, that made sense when the underlying foundations that a lot of the software was being built on were shifting, that you were moving from you know, on-prem to cloud, from um, you know, purely web-based software to now mobile, and you had different distribution channels and all that kind of stuff. But now that there's, I think, a little more stability in those underlying delivery vectors, I think that now the, the sort of overwhelming advantages of deep systems integration and bundled contracting and pricing are going to start to redominate. And there's this new wave of, of business or systems that are going to arise that are you know, sort of all in one. And I think one of the first examples of that is Salesforce. Because Salesforce is really, it, it sort of takes this underlying concept of customer data and builds a set of, has a set of capabilities around customer data, things like workflows and reports and query languages and a bunch of other stuff. And people really use Salesforce, not for just as a CRM and not just for pipeline reports, but really as a way to manage a lot of business process for everything that ties back to customers and customer data. And I think Rippling, I think of it as sort of a bizarro world version of Salesforce, that you have the same thing. Uh, you know, a, there's a set of business process that companies need to manage that requires a very similar set of tooling to what you have with Salesforce. Um, you know, you have a lot of the same fundamental concepts of, of workflow tools and reporting and analytics and policies and role-based permissions and a set of applications built on top of that. Um, to manage different things that relate to employees, whether on the HR side or on the IT side. But it just all needs to be built on a different underlying primitive, yeah. that you need to build it on this primitive concept of employee information instead of customer information. And that where, where Salesforce is this like externally facing system, that you're thinking about the outside world and all of your customers and how leads and contacts relate to accounts and how those accounts have relationship managers in your company. Uh, Rippling is the, the sort of mirror image of that, the internally facing system that 
is thinking about who are your employees and what is their job and role and function and what are their relationships to one another and all of the implications that that has for which systems they should access, <clears throat> how you think about the data that's coming in from all these different business systems, things like policies and permissions and workflows and reports and things like that. So it sounds like Facebook has the social graph, uh, Salesforce has the customer graph, and you've got the employee graph. We talk about the, the employee graph a lot, um, really to distinguish it from uh, what, what, what are now really employee directories. So Microsoft, a cornerstone of, of their business is Active Directory, which is this very sort of static view of, you know, like a table of here are, here's a list of your employees and their, their usernames and their passwords. And that, that concept of a directory has become for, for like the IT industry very broadly has become the source of employee identity. Um, but our view is that when you think about the meaning of the word identity, it's so much more than just usernames and passwords. It's, it's so much more than just auth. An employee's identity is really, you know, what's their job and their function at the company? Or what's their work location, their employment type? Who's their manager? What teams are they on? And then things like all of the information that you're pulling in about them from all of these other interrelated systems. You know, how many, if they're in support, how many outstanding Zendesk tickets do they have? Um, if they're an engineer, like, do they have open pull requests that haven't been reviewed yet? And that, that type of information about an employee is ultimately how you're making almost all of the decisions within your company about what systems they should be able to access, what alerts you need to send to different people, um, what needs to be approved and by whom. Um, and, and so that I think that graph-based representation of your employees and their data is a lot more powerful than just this sort of directory listing of, of the usernames and passwords for everyone in the business. So anyone who has a fundamental graph seems to also have um, a market size in the hundreds of billions. <laughs> Well, that sounds great. Where do I sign up for that? <laughs> it sounds like you're on, on track. I mean, do you think that there's a different type of organization that can happen with this type of software? I mean, one of the things that I've been <clears throat> thinking about a lot is um, these organizations get sort of only so big because, you know, there's a Coase's theory of the firm, right? That firms get only so big and then they become sort of um, encumbered by the... Uh, communication cost internal to that organization. Oh, that's really interesting. I, so I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with that, that concept, but one of the things that we do is we try to, to, to build a compound startup, <clears throat> we try and have these individual business units um, that are often led by um, you know, former founders. Rippling has a really high concentration of, of people who have started companies previously in their careers. Um, and we hire them to basically start and run products and business units within Rippling. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is actually disconnect each of these business units from each other as much as possible. Um, we're not there yet, but sometimes people talk to me internally about how we really need to like, you know, this team needs to coordinate with that team. And every time I hear that, I kind of think to myself like, man, that sounds terrible. That sounds like that's never going to work. Um, and instead, like, let's find a way that they don't have to coordinate with each other and they can, you know, there's some, you know, SLA or interface for whatever interaction they need to have. And then they can operate independently without being held back by, um, by the other team. I mean, what you were saying earlier, uh, and then if you combine it with this, what you're sort of saying is actually... Uh, being able to be even a startup within a startup or a team of teams, <clears throat> like I think yeah. Ryan Peterson likes to call it a team of teams. That's sort of being supported by the software that you had to build for the customers already, which is that employee graph. And then there's sort of new middleware you're building around things called Unity, for instance, that really, I mean, what it allows is a new engineering team, like product design engineering team within Rippling can go from like and basically an idea to a fully functioning SaaS product with thousands of customers, like seemingly overnight, or maybe in the course of like six or nine months. Whereas if you were an external startup trying to like, you know, rub two pennies together, you know, you might never do it. 
Yeah. Well, that's the idea. We like to think that basically, you know, if you're if you're going to start a new business inside of Rippling, um, there's a bunch of advantages that we can provide, um, and some of it is distribution. Um, that you know, we've been good. If we look at the, we we launched I think five or six new products last year, and I think we will launch about six or seven new products in 2022. And each one that we launch, the ramp curve is faster than the last one. And so the most recent one we launched is this product called Inventory Management. You can think of it as like a cloud IT closet. And so when you when you terminate an employee in Rippling, uh, you have this option where we'll just like send them a box to collect their computer. And that terminated employee puts the box in the computer, there's a prepaid shipping label, and it goes to a warehouse that was run by one of our partners. And they then, you know, get the computer out, they wipe it, they clean it, you know, physically and, you know, and, and, and the, the user accounts and stuff like that. And then it's like listed for you so that the next time you hire someone, you can just ship that same computer right back out to them. And that product launched four months ago and it's already at about $800,000 in ARR um, and growing about 40% month over month. And that, that's the fastest that we've had a new product grow, but all of them have just increasingly been the time to hit a million in revenue, the time to hit five million in revenue has just been shrinking with like every new product that we launch. Um, but the other thing that you get when, when you start one of these new products at Rippling is there's a lot of, there, uh, you know, a lot of business software ends up being built from the same fundamental underlying Lego blocks. You have, you know, role-based permissions. You have uh, reports and analytics, workflows, policies, alerts, and um, you take those set of components and you sort of set up one data model and and a slightly different, a, a very particular UX, and you rearrange them and you get a time tracking system. But then you take the same set of underlying components and a different data model and a different UX. And suddenly you have an expense reimbursement system um, or um, a learning management system or any number of other sort of products that you might need to build for businesses. And because, because you're using the same set of sort of middleware components over and over again, some of the things that, that customers really care about when they're buying business software, that often the teams that are building these products don't care about as much those things in Rippling end up being really good. A lot of companies, when they build business software, they end up building reports because their client makes them do it. You know, they kind of clutch it on as an afterthought. But at Rippling, when we build reports and we go really deep on that concept and we can, you know, we're trying to build a BI tool that will compete with standalone BI systems. And then every product that we build has, has report, reporting capabilities that are at that level of sophistication. I guess I'm seeing two different levels of this uh, Kosa's theory of the firm sort of playing out. One is at the like internal to rippling level where you're basically able to create new lines of business that go from zero to multi-million dollar per year and then ideally 10 to hundreds of millions in the future. And that's sort of like a, you know, a new innovation at the internal level. And then on the on your customer level, there's this other thing that happens where you know that product that you were mentioning, you know, ev who doesn't want to have proper you know laptop cleanup and reuse? Like what happens today at most firms? They probably just walk out the the door with it with all your confidential information, or you know, or certainly maybe you get the laptop back and it goes in a closet someplace because it, someone can't deal with it. Stacked up in your apartment somewhere. And you know, so, during COVID, I mean, that's that's what happened to us is we had. You know, there was a, a, a woman that ran this for us and she had just stacks of laptops piling up in her apartment in San Francisco. And, you know, things like that don't have to happen if Rippling can actually offer more and more of the standard services that are really just best practices. We already know who all of your employees are. We know their home addresses. It's integrated into the same flow that you use in Rippling to terminate an employee and calculate their final paycheck and administer Cobra and all that kind of stuff. So if you add this thing, it, it's, it's no more work, nothing else to manage. One of the things that sounds really powerful um, <clears throat> that is probably really underplayed and uh, one thing that I really love about what you've done with Rippling is like you always had a great focus on this was customer support. Like I just always 
love the idea of getting your engineering team to go and actually feel the pain of your customers because then it comes out in a bug report and most people sort of just drop it right in the bit bucket. Like they don't do anything yeah. with it, but you've taken a much different stance, like from the beginning. And then now it sounds like you've taken uh, an even more of a leadership role in like pioneering this like radical form of uh, customer support, actually. We, the scariest launch I've done in my entire career, we did a few weeks ago, because um, we, we took this move where we started publishing uh, daily customer support stats. Basically, all of the data that I look at internally for our support team, we started publishing right on our public-facing site. You can go look at it. It's rippling, rippling.com slash support status. Um, and it's scary because, you know, look, we're not perfect and we've had, we've had blips in the past on our support. Um, and I'm sure we will have blips in the future. And when we do, it's going to be out there for everyone to see, you know, competitors, customers, everything. But I think it's really the right thing for the industry um, and for our customers because um, first, it really holds us accountable. And then for customers, one of the things that we find a lot is, Look, I think we have a really cool product and really differentiated technology that solves a real problem. But what we find is that in, in sales conversations with customers, <clears throat> the big question they always have is about the support quality. And particularly for a product like what we do that's so core to your business, um, you know, if you're running someone's payroll, they get really nervous about what happens if it doesn't work and I can't reach someone. At the end of the day, we sort of realized, and the reason we decided to do this, in addition to it being the right thing to do, is we sort of figured no one's going to believe us if we just say, oh, no, we have great support. Because everyone says they have great support, and most companies don't. And the only way to really get credit for it is to take this leap and put yourself out there and actually publish the underlying data. And so my hope is that a lot of other companies will follow suit and do this. And I think that if you have a vendor or a software company that you're working with that doesn't do this, um, uh, you should sort of think about why they're not willing to do it. Yeah. Um, and that should sort of tell you something. Um, <clears throat> there are also, I mean, we, we've done support very differently since, since we started. And there are a number of, I think, I, I think really interesting things that we do to sort of try and make these support stats really good. Um, and it used to be, I think one of the things that happens is when you're an early stage company, um, I think you can have great support just by really caring a lot about support. And the problem is, is as you start to scale, just caring about it like doesn't really matter anymore. Um, that will only kind of get you so far. It's a prioritization thing. And then when you have 10 things that are all priority, none of them have a priority then. I think it's less about, you can make it a priority, but it still sucks. I think it, you know, just caring doesn't matter anymore. You have to be like really analytical about sort of how you're going to make it great and, and solve this sort of scaling challenge. That's your dashboard, right? A dashboard is something that <clears throat> the everyone dashboard is, can see. <clears throat> is one thing, but there are a few other things that we've done. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting, we had about a year ago, we were struggling with support. Um, and um, we had you know, much longer response times than, than we wanted. Um, and I was getting daily reports that showed me median time to first response on um, all of the different sort of channels that we offer support through chat, through email, through et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we started doing, and it was incredible, it solved this problem like overnight, is I forced the team to start reporting on 90th percentiles instead of 50th percentiles. Oh, wow. And so I said, basically, look, we're not gonna look at the median. Um, and we looked at the median, and what we, the reason I did this is we discovered the 90th percentile was like way worse than the median. <clears throat> and I said, the only thing that, I, that, that anyone's allowed to look at, and the only thing that I wanna see is the 90th percentile which is a much more punishing statistic. It basically says, it's like, what is the worst 10% of the support interactions that you have? And we started reporting on that. <clears throat> and within a week, the support time to first response numbers dropped so dramatically because what happens is when, when you're, if you want to improve your support and you're looking at the median support interaction, it's really hard to figure out like what you need to do. There's kind of, you're kind of like, well, I don't know, like, what do we do? Like, you know, you kind of go to your team, you're like, try harder guys, you know, like try and get back to customers faster. But when you look at 90th percentiles, 
it immediately calls out exceptions. You start looking at like, well, that's crazy. Like, why did it take us, you know, you know, an hour to respond to a customer chat? And you look at it and you start figuring out, it's much easier to wrap your head around. You notice things like in our case, we noticed that, you know, we would open up sort of support at, you know, 8 a.m. or something like that. And we would discover that, gosh, you know, a lot of the support managers were having one-on-ones with their team right at 8 a.m. when we opened when we opened up the chat support line. And so people were sitting there without getting answered. And so you could see that stuff when you focused on the 90th percentile on the worst interactions. And one of the things we found is we didn't even look at the medians, but the medians dropped astronomically because it's impossible if you focus on just chopping off the worst 10% of support interactions, it's impossible not to improve the medians as well. And like everything just dropped dramatically within the course of about two weeks. So one of the learnings that I had was like, if you're if you want to have great support as a company, you've got to focus on the relentlessly on the outliers, um, on the worst interactions, and that sort of naturally brings things down. The other thing that really worked well for us was looking at uh, was routing. Um, we spent a lot of time building systems to route tickets in software. Really, it's one of the only places in Rippling where we do a lot of machine learning. Um, but basically figuring out ways where you could constantly, as our support organization has grown, you know, we have now, I think like two or 300 support reps. And what, what you want is as your support organization grows, you wanna constantly basically shard your specialties until you get to narrow, narrower and narrower areas of focus. And so when we were a small company, it was like, well, you know, a bucket for, a bucket for payroll, a bucket for single sign-on and app management, a bucket for devices. And then as you get bigger, you take that payroll bucket and you break it down further and you have a specialty for, you know, uh, benefits deductions, a specialty for garnishments, a specialty for all these different things. And you just keep cutting it further and further and further so that, you know, every rep in the company has a specialty that they become like really the the product expert on. You know, they understand all of the things that go wrong for customers with that product. What are the questions they have? What are the issues that they encounter? And because of that, when you email in to Rippling and you have a question, your question gets routed to someone who knows these issues like backwards and forwards and can answer it immediately. What that does is that dramatically improves the likelihood that they can answer your question on the first response, which means you're more satisfied. It means they get back to you faster. And it also is more efficient from a cost perspective because those interactions where you have like 10 back and forths with someone, those are always just way more costly and leave them like much less satisfied. How do, I mean, both of these are incredible sort of actually nuggets that are really, it's, it's almost like finding something in the wild. It's like some new phenomenon that turns out to be true. Like the 90th percentile, not the 50th, 50th for instance, is like, that's fascinating. Do you have any tips for people watching who are running companies who are just trying to figure out like, well, how did you learn that? I have, have this theory that, that in a lot of places in a company, um, you're much better off looking at streams of individual data points than aggregate data. And an example of this in customer support is, um, we, you know, I look at sort of overall, you know, CSAT scores and time to first response and things like that. But <clears throat> the thing that I've always found most powerful is there's a Slack channel that we set up where anytime someone marks themselves as dissatisfied with a support interaction, it sends a message to the Slack channel. It includes a bunch of information about the customer, you know, like who the, who the person was, what their role is with the company, the size of the customer, the, the products that they've purchased in Rippling, and like a link to the ticket and a summary of the support interaction. At, at one point, I looked at every single time someone marked us like thumbs down, I would click in and watch oh, wow. that ticket. And I don't do it every single time anymore. But sometimes when I have a spare hour, I'll go in and, and just kind of look at the last 25 that came through. And sometimes you go in and, you know, look, sometimes customers are upset, but actually like I look at it and I think we did a great job on the support side. And I always think that that, that type of, that way of looking at the company, looking at streams of ANIC data rather than sort of global top-down metrics is a lot more powerful precisely because you can uncover a lot of these issues. You get a lot more insight 
because you have a lot more context. Aggregate data is helpful when you fully understand the problem and you just need to kind of measure your performance. But if, if you don't fully understand it, which is most of the time the situation that you're in at you know, running a company, I think anic data is superior to data like nine times out of 10. Um, because you have all of this context around the issue and, and you start to notice things that you're like, well, this is what's going on in this case. And you notice patterns that then lead you to make better decisions. I'm spotting a really important pattern here, which is, you know, whether it's anecdata data or data or um, it really is about just awareness and consciousness. Like if there's a problem, you need to know about it. Um, and then it's led you to very innovative things like, you know, there's a billboard outside here that actually has your number of seconds or minutes to a customer support person right now. Yeah, so one of the cool things, one of the side benefits, I think, of starting to publish our support metrics. We think of it, you know, we were inspired by sort of like status pages for uptime for websites. You know, we kind of like, well, why isn't there a status page for customer support that's doing the same thing? One of the sort of benefits of this is that, look, now when we get customers who are, you know, frustrated with the support quality they have with, you know, one of our competitors, for example, or they're nervous about, you know, starting with a new company and they don't know how good the support is going to be, we can just say, look, you don't have to take our word for it. You, we, we're publishing all the data on this. Like, you can go see it yourself. And that, that's that been really powerful. For example, we try, we started reaching out to prospective customers with this message about our real-time support stats and the conversion rates on some of these marketing campaigns are double or triple what they were for just our standard outreach about our product. Like, like pointing out this sort of like measured public support quality has been phenomenal from a marketing perspective. And so that's why we're now doing things like putting up billboards to sort of talk about sort of, hey, look, here's, here is yesterday's time to first response for rippling support in seconds. Yeah. I think that's so powerful because you run across businesses all the time and they, they say that they're customer, you know, focused or, you know, and the hard part is, you know, don't look at what they say, look at what actually happens. And that's right. And how do you, how do you know if they, I mean, look, and maybe, maybe they're incredibly well-intentioned, you know, like maybe they, they really want great support, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, caring about it is not enough. Like you, you need to be really steely eyed about sort of how you're gonna deliver this experience to customers effectively. I think the only way for customers to really know that is to like see it in stark relief and see the data. I mean, obviously I'm biased because I got to see you like in multiple, over many, many years build multiple companies. But I don't know, this focus, it's sort of like this data oriented hyper empathy for the customer. Also like this innovation of like compound startup. I mean. I really think you're gonna build this trillion dollar company, man. I hope so, that'd be great. But that's what it takes. Like I think that we just live in sort of a new realm where a lot of these companies were built without software. They were built without like the ability to have that sort of consciousness about like, oh, this thing's happening. We need to fix it in this way, but you're doing it. So thank you. Well, thank you. 